Yes, uh, I'm Joe Rita from Heavy Duty Kennels, located in uh, Connecticut. And uh, my journey started probably, I was probably at 10 or 11 years old. And uh, and actually, it's funny because I was just telling a story to my wife. She never knew. Because uh, she always says to me, I can't believe you've been dealing with these dogs all these years. And uh, a buddy of mine had an English bulldog. His factory, his father had it. We were 10 years old. Her name was Ginger. And she ended up getting pregnant by a Dalmatian. And uh, the three little puppies came out of, underneath the porch, you know, five, six weeks old. And there was a little uh, white male puppy. They, we called him Pee Wee. And it was, you know, it was a Dalmatian English Bulldog cross. So as uh, when the pup got about 12, 13 weeks old, we would all walk to the store and this little Pee Wee he would follow us down. It's about a quarter mile to the corner store and he'd get a little piece of beef jerky or whatever we were eating. We'd throw it to him and he'd follow us back and stay right on the sidewalk, you know, and he'd follow us everywhere we went. And, uh, after a few months, uh, take that back, maybe after eight or nine months, you know, we'd be walking with Pee Wee and the dogs would come out and, uh, they would try to fight Pee Wee and we'd pick up Pee Wee and he'd be in our arms even at three, four months old trying to fight him. You know, he was, he wanted to get him and these dogs were big and Pee Wee was just 12, 13 weeks old. So the following spring came, Pee Wee ends up being probably 75, 80 pounds and he'd follow us just like he did when he was a puppy. Spring came. And a few dogs came out. Now, he was too big for us to pick up at this point. So when the dogs came out, you know, to, to fight him or to do whatever they wanted to do with him, he would stay right with us. The dog would attack him, and Pee Wee would fight him. And Pee Wee would always win. And, you know, we would look, and, you know, we were petrified. And he would never chase the dog back in their yard. If the dog got close enough to him, he'd grab him. But he would never look for a fight. It was, you know, really weird. So there was one particular time, probably eight more nine months go by, and he's about two years old. And there was this one dog. And this is this is the reason why I'm going here with the story is is why I was infatuated with the bulldog. Probably if this day never happened, I don't think I'd be still fooling around with dogs in my 60s. So there's one particular dog. Now he's Pee Wee's about two years old. He's about 85 pounds, probably. You know, it's hard for me to tell. He's only 10, but I'd say he went about 18, 19 inches to the wither. But he was all rock, rock a muscle. And there was this one German shepherd from Germany. I'll never forget it. He was that long coat. And this dog was always chained up to the garage. And every time we went by with or without Pee Wee, this dog would go ballistic. And we always said, hey, we always looked. And if this dog ever got loose, we knew we had to run. Well, we're walking one day and uh, we had Pee Wee. He was pissing on his favorite maple tree. We walked by the garage, looked down the driveway, and there's that big German Shepherd going crazy. And he gets loose from his chain. And we start running. And we're running to a tree to climb the tree. And here comes Pee Wee. He slams the dog, bites him. Uh, I get the chills just talking about it. Bites him right on the side of his head. The German Shepherd had to go a good hundred pounds. And Pee Wee held on for all he could. And the dog, the big German Shepherd was shaking and shaking, trying to shake him loose. And Pee Wee locked on him and held him. All he could do was hold him. He was much smaller. He held them long enough for that German Shepherd got exhausted. And Pee Wee held on him, was on top of him. The Shepherd got loose and ran back to his house. We were, we were amazed. And I've thought about that as I got older. And uh, we got, you know, I was about 15, 16. Pee Wee was still around. He was about five. He used to walk down the street. And my father says, the next time that dog comes in here and pisses on my 
trees, I'm going to get them. I said, Dad, don't 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 attack Pee Wee. And my father goes, What do you mean? Oh. I says, Pee Wee will come after you. If you if you 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 show aggression to Pee Wee, he'll come after you. So Pee Wee comes walking down the street. I'm 15, 16 years old, and I probably haven't seen Pee Wee in a year or two. Who's going to the store? Comes up in my yard, goes to piss. My father goes after him with a shovel. The dog chased my father all the way back down the driveway. <laughs> and uh, one thing about it, so that that intrigued me. To, like, how could this English bulldog mommy that could barely walk produce a dog like this? You know, pretty damn functional dog. Very muscled up dog, real good looking dog. And uh, I, I think that's what got me hooked. And I, you know, when I got about 15, 16, I started my journey of crossing just, you know, a bull mass to, to an English and whatever direction I wanted to go. But I think that's where it really all started. I bought my first dog when I was 16. I got my first dog. It was uh, um, back then, you know, no. Back in the 70s, a lot of people didn't know what a pit bull was. Really? The re, you know, you said the word pit bull. What's that? You know, but I got my first, uh, it was actually a red-nosed pit bull. And then I ended up breeding that first litter. I ended up breeding that to a bull mastiff. Knowing that what the English Bulldog Dalmatian cross did, I, you know, I figured I wanted something a little bit bigger. And so I started, I started with that cross and then I took it back to a, an English bulldog and um, it, it, it was like a custom, you know, you could make them any way you want. And that really intrigued me when you, when you mix the breeds together, um, you start understanding what traits are um, more uh, like pronounced, you know, the pit bull always, their gene pool was very strong. So you, they were very dominant in the litters. So you, you really had to, you know, go two, three generations out to get what you thought you were going to get the first generation. But uh, that's kind of how it all, that was my first, almost like a band dog, you know. And then, you know, I shortened them up, thickened them up. So my, whatever, whatever direction I wanted to go at that time, you know, you change over the years what you like, what you don't like, what you like to change, you know, what you think will be a, you know, because nobody was really, you know, nobody that I knew was really doing that like that, you know, at that time. The Americans, it was, a, uh, the, the American Bulldogs, there was, um, there again, like nobody, nobody in the state of Connecticut heard of such a thing. I seen it in an old Dog World magazine. I seen a, a little article, it said, Bulldog puppies, five hundred dollars. Now, even back then, five hundred was a good amount of money, but it wasn't, you know, a real crazy amount of money. And I ended up buying two bulldogs, and they were American bulldogs when I got them. That's what they were, you know. These dad just said bulldogs, and actually, um, they were pure white. And then there were big dogs, you know, 90 pound dogs. They were nice dogs. And then I said to myself, you know, boy, that would be nice. With a, you know, if I can find me a nice heavy bone English. I was, <laughs> then I started crossing the English with the uh, American Bulldogs. And it really made a nice, really made a nice dog. And uh, then I got into the uh, breeding, just the pure uh, American Bulldogs. There was a guy in Massachusetts, uh, Steve LeClaire. The clerk. He had a dog called Raging Bull. It was a half Johnson dog, and I got some dogs down from uh, him. Then I got some dogs from Rayburn Stover down in Alabama. Actually, I got most of this. The old, all these NKC. Going back to the early, late eighties and nineties. Uh, uh, he had some really nice American Bulldogs, but you know, you always want them to be more bully. You know, you never can, I could never get enough to make the dogs more bully. You know, that was my, that was my thing. I just wanted to make them functional bull, 
but yet look like a bulldog, you know. So, uh, yeah, that's what I did with the American Bulldogs. Then I got Crunch from Mountain Gator Kennels. And the rest is history, man. Then I, I, I liked him, but I wanted him, and I wanted him bullier. And, um, yeah, I just could have had that bully fever, I guess. Make a bully. We had a lot of, uh, you know, we dealt with a lot of uh, Johnson dogs. And um, the, probably the bulliest line back in the day, and probably still is today, you know. You couldn't uh, get a bullier dog than that bulldozer bull, but. Um, so that would be your bully. Yes, you know, you use those lines and the mountain gator kennels with Mark Landers. He, he had a, he had some tremendous, tremendous dogs. And I, I'm trying to think of you. That was in the night. That was in, um, probably, oh God, late eighties, early nineties. So that's going back. Uh, what's that going back? 30, 30 some years or, or better. But, um, he, he had a couple few dogs in particular, if people do a little research, a dog called Half Acre and Bam Bam. I had a couple direct sons off of Mountain Gator Kennels, Bam Bam, real super bully dogs, beautiful. And uh, he had a, do a doozy gator breedings that were producing, uh, you know, 110 pound, 27 inch head dogs, rock bodies. They were heavy weight pull he used to weight pull his dog, so they're pretty structurally, they're pretty sound, but yet they were bully. And uh, and there I go again. That wasn't enough for me. I got a, I wanted more bully. <laughs> and you know, you start taking the bulliest dog to the bulliest dog and get the bulliest dog, and that's just how that goes. And you know, then you had to be careful because you didn't want to lose structure because back in the day. You know, one thing I'll say about the guys with the American Bulldogs back in the day. If you had a dog that wasn't structurally correct, they shunned you. You know, because they were, you know, which was the right thing to do. The dogs had to be functional because uh, they, had, they had a purpose, you know. They had to be, they had to be functional. And that's, that's what I did, you know. I just tried to, I liked them really super bully. And that's kind of what I was known for. What are what were some of the challenges uh, that you you had um, with breeding bulldogs and, and more of the bullier types? Well, the biggest really the biggest challenge was not getting too carried away, um, and the breathing. You had to be real careful uh, of the dogs that you selected because breathing with the American bulldogs is a big problem. They uh, between the soft palate and the closed nears, um, you know, you really took away from the dogs. You know, you had to be real careful. You had to be real selective. Um, you know, you wanted the look, but you didn't want everything that came with it. You know, and the breathing to me was the biggest thing. You had to be. Uh, it's no fun having a dog you can't take nowhere on an eighty degree day. I mean, you know. It's just no fun. Or you have to worry about the dog home. He's in the AC, and I didn't go for that. My dogs, you know, he lived outside. If I, you know, but breathing was a big issue for sure. What was their lifespan uh, back in the day compared to, like, say now? Well, I, I, I don't think that was much a difference. You know, a good dog, you know, you can get 10, 12 years out of them. You know, um, they were pretty, you know, Back in the day, the dogs were, they were pretty healthy. That, I think that had a lot to do with, um, that's when all the lines were being mixed, a lot of hybrid vigor, because um, today today seems like the, the, the American Bulldogs of today, um, there's a few guys that still have some really nice dogs out there. Um, but there's just a few. Back, you know, back in the day, um, and I be, and I believe this is, you know, the reason for it, because when John D. Johnson did the bulldog crosses into the, you know, the American bulldog, um, that bulldog was closer in the pedigree, the dogs that we were getting back in the 90s, 
and over the years, when you keep reading these American Bulldogs, it seems like that dominant trait, like I was talking about before, like the pit bull or the longer muzzled dog dominates the uh, gene pool. So over the years, if you don't line breed on the bully dogs, uh, you kind of lose that look. And uh, I noticed that when I was breeding to try to keep that look, you, you know, you had to, you had to do a lot of line breeding and uh, stuff like that to keep the keep the, the the way I liked them. But this, like I say, it's just the way I liked them. You know, it doesn't mean when I like something, somebody else has to like it. I never, that never, uh, I, the other person liked it. It's it's what I I did what you know, I I did what I wanted to do with the dogs. You know, make them the way I wanted them. Well. There's a lot, there's a, there's a number of things. The biggest thing was back when we were back in the early nineties, eighties and nineties, we'd have to travel eight, 900 miles to look at a dog to breed to the dog. And when you get there, sometimes the dog wasn't what you thought it was, you know, uh, today you could have a picture or video of a dog within 20 seconds. And uh, you could have a pretty good idea of what the dog's all about. So we really had to go on our gut instinct. We had to go on our knowledge of the lines, what this dog should look like when we get there. So, you know, you, you, know, you can't go eight, 900 miles on a win. You gotta, you gotta feel, you gotta know what you're going to look at before you even get there. And it should fit the bill. So you had, you know, you had, you had to be educated with the breed. I mean, today, well, let's see what it looks like. Boom, here comes a picture. Um, okay, let me see a video, you know. Uh, oh, you know, I, I, we had to travel. You know, that's the biggest difference. We had to put the work in, you know. I mean, really, we had to put the work in because there wasn't that many dogs back then. There wasn't that many, and if you if and it was word of mouth. Somebody said, "Hey, you see this dude's got this dog? Oh, who's he off for? Bah bah bah." You know, so oh, man, I think should look. Oh yeah, what did it look like? So you really had to trust people's judgment. You know, you could ask just anybody how a dog looked because a good looking dog to him may not be a good looking dog to me. So we used to roll in a certain group. And we would know, hey, does it look like this? Dog? No, he's got a bigger head. He's more bony. You're like, holy shit, you're kidding me. So right then and there, we're taking the eight, 900 mile ride. We're going to breed to this dog. We're going to, you know, we're going to use this dog. So that's how we did things back then. Like I say, today, you know, somebody shoots you a video within 20 seconds. And uh, that's it. You know, so it's a pretty big difference. We really had to put the time in. What do you call it? VHL? You know what they're calling it? The VHS used to come in the mail. And uh, we'd wait. Sometimes I'd come home from work. First thing I'd do is grab and look in the mailbox, see if it came, see if it came. Get a video, you know, get a video so we didn't have to travel to see the dog, you know. And uh, it actually was pretty exciting when you got that video, you know. I'd come right in the house and put it in and watch it and watch it over and over watch the rear end on the dog, watch the fronts, look at the head, you know, have a, try to get a size comparison. How big is this dog? You know, is this dog worth going to breed to it? You know, a lot of these dogs were, you know, I'm up, I'm in Connecticut. I'm on the other side of the world over here. Everything's down in central States. And, uh, you know, they're always out down South really. And, uh, so then we had to, we had to get in the truck and we had to travel to make this happen. Especially in Connecticut, there was nobody else really fooling with the dogs when I started. I think, I think I was the first one in the state to have the American Bulldogs, but then a few other guys kind of got into it. A few guys from Mass, but yeah. Talk about the the evolution of the uh, old English Bulldog and how you were there in the, in the beginning. Okay, so the the old English uh, Bulldog in the seventies. Um, there was, you know, there's probably a few other people um, doing them. Um, what I what I was doing right from the get, I always used an English bulldog, breeding the bull mastiff, putting some pivot. It was pretty much the same formula, but I was just doing it for me. You know, I was doing it 
it always reverted back to when I was an 11 year old kid seeing that Dalmatian English cross. What an awesome dog it made. So from the time I'm 11 to the time I'm in my 20s and 30s, I'm still chasing. We used to call it chasing the dragon, you know, chasing that ultimate bulldog and whatever it takes to get there, whatever it took, you know, whatever cross you had to make. So we were, you know, I was doing that. I'd sell them out of the newspaper and I'd keep a couple back for me. And then um, there was a guy, did I tell you his name? There's a uh, Ben Campetti. I think Dave, Dave might have knew him. He had a bunch of Dave, Dave's dog back in the 70s. And I seen an ad. It, it was in the local paper. And I went there. It was in, I'll never forget it, Sanders Field, Massachusetts. And he had a bunch of Dave Levitt dogs there. So I ended up getting a couple dogs from him and I'm crossing him into some of the stuff I was doing, which probably they wouldn't have been too happy with at the time. Uh, but he was, you know, he, you know, Dave coined the name. Dave is very educated guy. He coined the name. He had his own registry by this time. And, uh, you know, me, I was just breeding dogs for me and, and making that peewee dog again. You know, we're going to have, I'm going to have a whole yard full of peewee dogs, you know. And then, um, then we got a little crazy. You know, Greg was there. Greg was around and I had some massive stuff and Greg had some massive stuff and we got a hold of a few of dogs from Greg Hermes. So now the dogs got big. They got crazy looking. Um, you know, we had dogs 140 pounds, 130 pounds. They had feet like your hands. You know, when they used to call our yards Jurassic Park. <laughs> when we got, we, in the like 2000, we had them. They were, uh, so we, you know, we were crossing all, blending all these different bloodlines in to try to create this, uh, you know, big monster, old bulldoggy, you know. It was a lot. That was, that was, uh, that I, 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 my line was, uh, I called them the Georgia Giants. And, um, yeah, we did that for quite a few years. And uh, another breeder, actually, that had some really nice dogs, and I did a lot of work with them, is uh, Mighty Max. I had a Swansea Mass, Big Jim, rest in peace, Jim. But um, he had, he had some beautiful Hermes-style dogs, but they were big. We both had them, you know, we used to work together, but uh, that was definitely the, the biggest journey of dogs I had. And very exciting to, when you cross mix them bloods together, you get the hybrid vigor and you get, you know, it's, it's fun because you, you think what you should get and when you get it and when you hit it and it clicks, there's no other feeling to this day. I, I like crossing bulldogs to bulldogs. If you've done it, I don't want to do it. I want I want to do something that nobody else done. And when it works, I feel better than if I took two dogs, you know, an American to an American, you get an American. Like I said, you know, today's day, a lot of times when you do that, you do, you know, it's almost like you gotta re this is just for me, like I said. I like to reintroduce bulldog if needed unless you're getting exactly what you want at the end of that leash then you you know you breed how you want if you want a, a bullier dog a more stout dog you want those big apple cheeks you got to do whatever it takes to get that because nobody's going to give you that and whatever whatever you whatever you got to do to get it i do it good good, wrong, indifferent, uh, are people against it? I call them what they are now. It's an F1, whatever, whatever. People put, problem with today is people put letters in front of the bulldog. American, oldie, F1, F2. They're just bulldogs, man. When you take an American bulldog, a well-bred American bulldog, and you take a well-bred oldie, you put them together, 
still a bulldog. Still a bulldog. And if it clicks, if it clicks, you got something special. You know? And uh, like I say, there's a few guys out there that's a really nice American bulldog still. There's, you know, not many, I, you know. Um, but there's a few guys that have it, have them, and there's some people with some beautiful oldies out there. But like I say, um, I like a 20 inch tall. My ideal bulldog's 20 inches, 90 to 100 pound. That's my sweet spot. You get them any shorter, now you, you know, you're into that pocket area. You get them any taller, a lot of times, you know, you're starting to deal with a leggy dog, you know. So there's definitely a sweet spot, you know. You know, there's some guys out there that are, you know, have this 20 inch, 90 pound dog. Um, but that's, you know, that's what I like, you know, that's, and, and those dogs, you basically almost got to make them yourself, you know, and uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's how I do it. I, like I say, I do, I do dogs for me, you know, I don't put letters in front of them. Uh, um, some people, you know, they chase a pedigree or they, uh, pedigrees are important, um, but you know, they'll chase a registry, they'll chase, you know, some. It's what you have at the end of that leash is all that matters. It's all that matters. It's what's right there. It's not what's in your back pocket. Oh, here's the paperwork. Because when you walk down the road, the people are asking you for the fucking paperwork. You know, oh, what registry? Who's the sire? All hype, you know. Hey, if you walk down the road, with a 20-inch tall dog, with a 27-inch head, with a one-inch muzzle, that shredded. Does it really matter? It don't matter to me. Because I want that dog. And whatever it takes to get that dog is what you got to do to get it. So don't, you know, don't feel boxed in that, you know, uh, you're breaking rules and you're doing this. They're all bulldogs. At the end of the day, they're all bulldogs. And I thought this from the time I seen that peewee dog. That's why I brought up that peewee dog. You know, that Dalmatian cross. It made a better bulldog cross. And, and, and maybe that's what got me, maybe that's why I think the way I think today. I don't know. You know, I, I just know that creating something that you want is whatever it takes you. You know, like I tell people, whatever it takes to get there. And a lot of people, you know, you ain't there yet. You know, neither am I. We're always going to chase the dragon. And uh, whatever you got to do to get there, you know, I'm, I was always willing to do it. I'll push the envelope, uh, uh, you know, whatever you know, whatever it took to get that, that, that freaky ass dog, you know. <laughs> and uh, it was a crazy, it's a crazy journey, but, you know, it works for me, you know. I've had some good ones over the years, you know. What was your reception like back in the day? Like, how how did the dog world look at you and say Greg and all the you know the other guys that were doing your style of bulldog? What was what was it? What was well, you know. See the problem, the problem like what I was just saying. You know, I do whatever it took to get to where I wanted to go. Right. I didn't have any rules. There is no rules. I, I broke every rule out there. I, you know, um, cause I do what I want, but I got the, the end of the day, I got what I wanted. Um, but, um, a quick story about like the American bulldogs. A lot of people don't know. Okay. I'm trying to get a year. is in the early, I'd like to say early nineties, maybe mid nineties, maybe somebody can help me out with the years, but it was around maybe, 94, 95, there was, um, uh, we used to go back and forth with the guys from down south, you know. Uh, I believe it was Yang KC was having an issue with uh, the standard of the breed. And they wanted the standard of the breed to breed. These American Bulldogs were going to be working dogs. The standard was a lot smaller dog, not as bully, because the bully dogs, they said, couldn't work. So we used to battle, you know, with these guys. Hey, you know, we wanted this 
the standard to say, you know, to include the bully dogs, you know. And now these are working hog dogs. These dogs got to bite. They have to take 100 degree weather. They have to run five miles, die rough for this. They got they got to do all this crazy shit. And um, so if your dog can't do that, it shouldn't be classified as an American Bulldog. The standard should not be written for the dog that cannot work. An American Bulldog is a working dog. So, you know, we had our hands full with, you know, we're, now this is going to, this is going to be, this is a why in the road. This either is the, the detriment to the bully American Bulldog or if somebody doesn't do something quick to get these dogs accepted so the standard includes them, um, you know, so Mark Landers at the time was uh, working his dogs on weight pull. So weight pull, he was he had a bunch of champions, which was a good thing because now you have a working bully dog. So when we go to the NKC, was having a um, a big, what you call like a, this is a to revamp the standard. They're going to change the standard this weekend. That weekend, they're going to change it, and everybody's going to be there, and everybody's going to have input. So they gave us like six months advance notice so we're going back and forth with these guys from the south south it's, it was this uh was in manassas virginia and uh they were saying listen the dogs can't work without you're going to be one standard no classic no dual standard there's going to be one standard of the breed and casey courtier from watchdog kennels he was a big he he wanted one standard he wanted a working dog you had mark landers a mount gary he, he wanted the bully dogs, but the bully dogs couldn't work. And they had, you know, they had a little bit of a point there. So it was important that um, we showed up with some working dogs. So I started crunch on weight pull, uh, weight pull, on hang time. They were having a big hang time competition with all the dogs from the South. We're all meeting in Virginia. And there was a hang time competition. So Crunch had a lot of prey drive, a lot of drive, had a good bite. So we start working him on a spring pole and uh, doing hang time with him. And he was, he was, uh, uh, he was born to do it, I guess, I guess you could say. Matter of fact, when I picked him out of the video, he was tugging on Mark Lander's shoe. And that's why I wanted him. So we trained him for about six, eight months. I got him pretty lean. So the weekend that we're going to go down there and we're going to enter him into this competition against a lot of hog dogs, uh, you know, the more of the hybrid type dogs. So on the way down there, we don't realize it, but it's getting really hot. It's pushing 90, 95 degrees. And we're in the van and we're saying, hey, man, <laughs> we might want to turn around. It's too hot. It's too hot, dude. You can't put this on. You know, I said, man, we're almost there. So we get out there and it's 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 blazing. It's humid, humid, and there's geez, hundreds and hundreds of dogs and people. So one of the southern guys, oh, you guys made it from Connecticut. Oh, yeah, we made it. And uh he goes, You sure that dog ain't gonna die out here today? I said, I don't think so. And uh, he said, well, we're going to start this competition in a half hour. You better be ready. And every, you know, they all start laughing. They see this dog with a pushed-in muzzle. And uh, so my buddy Paulie and I have my cousin also, he goes, hey, man, don't do it. It's too hot. You're going to kill this dog. I said, hey, man. I said, these are two things are going to happen. Either we're going to go home without him or we're going to we're going to win because this dog, this dog will make it happen. So anyway, so I'm in line and there, everybody's kind of goofing on my red and white dog with a smashed face. He goes, you see the guy ahead of me, you see this dog? I go, yeah. He says, this the hardest bite hog dog from straight from out. I forget what, Heinz Country Boy, some crazy shit, you know? And I said, and he tells me it's the hardest biting dog here. So I have some working hog dogs, right? 
from Florida. Gives me the whole thing. He goes, what's that? I said, that's the baddest motherfucker on the East Coast. <laughs> right? And he kind of looks at me. So anyway, make a long story short. Everybody goes up on that rope for about 15 minutes. And they're swinging, they're hanging, they're tugging. And I'm like, holy shit, man, it's hot. So it's Crunchy's turn. I turn him loose. He hits the spring pole. He gets up on there. I mean, we got videotape of it, too, I believe. And he starts just swinging. And he's growling. He's swinging. 10 minutes, 12 minutes. And the dog's, you know, connected to you. His eyes is looking at your eyes. When your eyes are intent, Crunch's eyes, he's intent. He had no quit in him. You know, 15 minutes. So now he has to beat 15 minutes. 20 minutes, 25 minutes. His eyes are turning red. So I pull him off. He wins this competition. Cool him down. He wins the comp, which was a big thing because now we got to go to the NKC and say, look, we beat your own dogs at your own game. And they couldn't argue the point. Couldn't argue with videotape of the door, the competition. There's people that were there at the competition. Mark Landers was winning all the IWPA. And I don't know if it's still to today. There was two standards. I don't know today if there's still two standards, but they, they the, the bully American Bulldog, maybe if it wasn't for like Crunch doing his thing and Mark and a few other guys working these bully dogs, I don't know if the bully dogs today what would have happened if they would have went off the radar or not, you know? But that was a big, uh, back then, that was a pretty big deal. I used to tell the guys, hey, listen, listen, there's 12 players on a football team on the field, right? You got a nose tackle and you got a wide receiver. Both athletes, two different, two different animals. You know what I mean? And that's how I used to say, look, I like the middle linebacker. I like the nose tackle. You know, they're all athletes. You know, that's what that, everything's the dogs are functional but they have to well like i like i kind of reverted to before um i'm all about what's at the end of the leash i i believe in a pedigree i i you know pedigrees helps people um produce pedigree you, you really should know what is behind your dog there's no pedigrees are they're important i mean don't get me wrong i would agree to a dog pedigree that I didn't know didn't have a pedigree just by the looks of the dog I would do it I would do it like I said I'll do whatever it takes if I think that's going to get to where I need to go I want to get there and if you know that's just me um it's nice to know what's behind these dogs you know because if there's some faults some things that you you know you don't want in there pedigree is important pedigree nice to have I'm all about that the registry part of it um I guess you need, you know, I'm not, you know, registry. I'm not like the, uh, as long as you have a pedigree and the dog is registered, if it's a big name, uh, registry or small name, don't matter to me. It's what's like I say, I always revert back to, just give me the dog, man. I just want the dog. <laughs> just give me that pumpkin head. Give me that big apple cheeks. Give me that bone. You know, just give me all that, man. That's that's, that's what it's when, when I when somebody comes in my house and they see a dog with a 26, 27 inch head, and he's got bones like elephant legs, and he's looking at you, and you're like, holy shit, look at that fucking dog. That's all I, you know, that's what I want. You know, the shows and all that business. Uh, the fancy registries, you know, these registries can be a little funny, especially with the oldies, you know, who can get an F1 registered, who can't, um, uh, uh, they could be, you know, they could be, you know, they could be funny and, you know, now, you know, it's just, I'm not a big fan of some of the registries. I believe in sometimes a registry to me is a registry, you know, back in the day we had CKC, we had ARF. ADA, um, uh, you know, the NKC, uh, there was a bunch of other ones. I don't know really what's out there today. Like, I don't really get into all that because um, back in my day, when we were 
helping develop the breed. I mean, we're back in the 70s and 80s and 90s. We, our pedigree would be a yellow P. I was trying to find it today because I had it out not too long ago because I posted it on Facebook. But um, all our pedigrees were, this is before all these big name registers were around, was a yellow line paper with Polaroid pictures stuck to it. And underneath that dog, they'd say quarter bull mastiff, quarter English bulldog, half American bulldog, whatever. And then how much the guy would want for the dog. And there'd be a, you know, five or six dogs on that piece of yellow lined paper. That was our pedigree. That's all it was. So, you know, now, I'm, you know, so to me, the registries, because I come from that era, the registries don't mean nothing to me. Don't mean nothing. But that's me. That's because I came from, there was no registries. Actually, uh, I got one of Dave Levitt's old pedigree. Well, over here, I pulled it out. Um, Dave Levitt had pedigrees and registries in the 70s. You know, he coined the name. Hey, he coined the name on the oldies. He coined the name. He had everything documented. He did everything right, man. You know? And uh, me, like I say, I just wanted to make that badass dog. I wanted to make that peewee again. You know, I wanted to, <laughs> you know. So I'm not a big reg you know, fan of the fancy registries, you know. Um, is there a need for, for them? Probably, you know. But not for where I came from, what I've seen over the years, you know. But that's my, you know, that's just me being me. Yeah, well, you know something? This is something that I've said 30, 40 years. And this is, you know, this is something that I I truly believe in. Um, a good dog is where you find it. It's that simple. It's that simple. It's where you find it. It's not all well, the fancy bells and whistles. There, there was a time... Jesus. Uh, I probably was in my 30s and I was driving down the road. <laughs> Sounds crazy. And I see this white, you know, you can call it American Bulldog. Like I said, I'm not going to put letters. It was a bulldog for sure. And it was chained up to a tree with a doghouse. And he was beautiful. He had bone and he was muscled up. His back legs looked like a quarter horse. I mean, he was put together like a brick shit house. He really was. So the lady, I knock on, hey, who's the dog? Oh, that's my son's dog. He leaves it here. There's nothing but bark. Bye, bye, bye. I got to get rid of it. She was telling me she's got to get rid of the dog, right? I'll pull you right now. So I says, back then, I said, you take 500. 500? You'll give me 500 for the dog? I says, yeah, you know, I like the dog. I end up buying the dog for $500, right? And he was the, one of the baddest dogs I ever had. And, and I always, and you know, it's funny because I used to always say a good dog is where you find it. It's all it really is, you know, it's really true. You know, people don't think so. They think you gotta hype it up and you know, you, one thing in dogs, you can't hype up a bad dog because you, you know, because eventually people are going to see the dog, you know, and, um, but yeah, you know, good dog is where you find it. I truly believe that. Yeah, I, I see the difference to now than back in the day is that you guys were willing to take way more risks, you know? <clears throat> yeah, well, we had to because, like I say, there was a small gene pool. There wasn't much around, you know. Th th these, this was early on, you know. This is, you know, like I say, this is pre-registries. Um, but we were able to really do anything we really wanted to do, you know. Um, there was nobody really restricting you, you know, and like, okay, perfect example. Okay. The older bulldoggies, right? You got, you know, the guys that like the super performance, then, you know, then you got the, the people, the pet people that want the heavy English bulldog, right? Which is probably a lot of the people. Um, 
there's the oldies and you know people this is just the way i see it you know maybe i'm wrong maybe i'm right it's just the way i see it the people that are breeding the dogs um 15 inches tall six you know 14 15 i've seen them as small as 14 inches oldie bulldoggies and look like english bulldog and i, I just say to myself and, and, I just say to myself, I hate to say it, but I gotta say it. Why would you know? I don't care what anybody does. You know, everybody, like I say, do it. You know, do what you gotta do. But why would anybody? There's already an English bulldog. You're never gonna beat the English bulldog at its own game. An oldie is not an English bulldog. No matter how many times you go back to the English, you're not gonna beat the English. And if you sell the people, look, my look at mine looks so much like an English. Well, the people are just just buy the fucking English. So when you go ahead the English with the oldies, you got, you come with all the problems. But I, you know, that that that's you know that's the thing with the you know I seen with the oldies. You know, they're uh, they went real heavy. A lot, a lot of people go real heavy on the English. You, you know, the, you stunt them and you end up with a lot of a lot of issues the dogs you know um back in the day we didn't do that you know there was some english in there but it wasn't much and like i say we had dogs uh 130 something pounds you know and uh, when i got when i kind of started fooling with dogs again i tell i start looking for them and <laughs> three or four guys say hey joe guess what they're extinct <laughs> you want it you better make them again so you know that's what you got to do what were the English like back in the day that you guys were around? Back back in the day, we had some uh, big bone. I had a, I had a male, eighty four pounds. Uh, they were. Uh, I didn't have many. You didn't need many. You know, I just had a couple a couple of males that I would use, and um, but they all had to have. They were big bone dogs. They were a little different. They. I thought they were a little, quite a bit bigger than they are today. Um, cause there, we didn't have, we didn't fool around no 55 pound English. Ours, I had one 84 pound, 85 pounds. I used to call them Rita's hanky panky. Um, I'll send you some pictures of him. He was a big, I still got pictures of him. He was a, he was a big boy. But, uh, yeah, I just think people went a little crazy with the English, you know, not everybody and this ain't for everybody, but well, I think that kind of hurt the breed. I really do. Because you're chasing the English again, but there's already an English. So I don't, I don't get it. I never got that. You, you want to, you want to put someone out there that's not already there. You know, you want to be special. You want to make the breed special. You know. But that's just like I say. Everything I do, I do, I do things different. You know, and right, wrong, or indifferent. I just <laughs> that's the way I operate. You know. I'll ask you a, a hypothetical: is if you were if I said create me an old English from scratch right now, what would what would what would it be like? What's what's your recipe? Ooh. Well, I would you know, I'll I I'll tell you what I think works. The my style dog, right? I like to use I would use um America Bulldog. I'll even get a little Pacific because of some of the newer lines that are out there. That Mufasa bloodline. Um, I would use that blood and for, for the purpose of the tight muscle, the tight coat, the head tight. And uh, they're a pretty drivey dog too. So if it, you know, which, come, which comes in handy. That would be my Amer American bulldog, and then I would go into a, a I'd go into like a, a, a an oldie, a generational maybe oldie, that's bred maybe kind of tight, but it has to have you know heavy bone, and I think that cross right there, you know, if it clicks, it's always you know that's always the thing, and it should click, because um, you know you're bringing the bone in, you're 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 making the dog a little bit more compact. You know that Mufasa blood like likes to throw those big, you know, big apple cheeks. You know, that, but you know, um, you just gotta watch. Like I say, you just gotta 
you gotta watch the breathing you know that's that's always your the biggest the, my biggest concern because uh i don't like to see no dog suffer with the heat stroke i've seen it at dog shows and i don't want to be a part of of that you know it's important that uh but that was that you can make a nice functional oldie just like that you really can and people do it and uh that's what i prefer because at the end of the day right do you really want to walk down the road Here, here's what happens if you don't have the right dog you walk down the road 85 degrees your dog has a heat stroke okay it went heavy you know heavy on the english bulldog the dog's too too overdone right or you walk down the road and the lady's poodle comes up and gives your dog a beating because he can't breathe. I mean, uh, you know, I don't want to be a part of that either. You know what I mean? So it's important that your dogs can function, you know? And I, you know, like I say, that's my ultimate dog, you know? Give me something about 20 inches, 95 pounds, short back, big head. And uh, I'm happy. <laughs> Um, well, the beast, the beast of the east. We used to go to your trying to get back to the years. Um, I guess I don't know. We used to go to shows in the 80s and 90s, and you know, we used to travel to the shows. A lot of them were in Virginia, and a lot of uh, uh, hog dogs, and there was a lot of hybrids. And, you know, they, nobody had the stuff that we had, you know, we had the heavy Johnson lines. And, mgk stuff and uh we won't play we go there and they'd be they'd be all these hog dogs they'd win everything and you know to me they look like dalmatians uh, they didn't do anything for me but we go all the way there and uh wasn't just us a few guys from ohio a few guys from you know and we won't place nothing you know pay our money and we wouldn't even place so i said you know something we're gonna do a show for the bully dogs and we you know so i started a show called the beast of the east and uh it was a place to it was a venue to showcase extreme american bulldogs or bully dogs bully american bulldogs and um that's how it started you know that's how it started and it, it kept growing and growing and growing and uh just recently uh gina and um chris had a, a like almost like a reunion type beast to these. They did a fantastic job. It was a great turnout. Um, had a really good time. They did a really, really good job. They're really good people. But um, that's how it started. And um, uh, it was bragging rights. I mean, um, we told dogs to come in from all over. They were coming in from Texas, California. Out, you know, they were coming in from Canada. I mean, we... we we told the bully dogs bring it because we we got some we got some stuff up here on the east coast and we did you know but they came and they came and uh we had a good time and that's where we started really clicking the bloods together that bulldozer some guys from ohio uh phil he had a lot of that bulldozer bull phil bender uh bulldozer bull blood he come in with that stuff and Doug Kennedy, uh, some of his dogs would come in, uh, and we start. They got that fast blood. We we mixed the blood, which was a really a good thing because the, the dogs took off after that. They really did. The dogs took off, and um, because of the, those shows, I believe uh, the lines got a lot, a lot stronger. You know, a lot more good dogs got developed because people got to see. Hey, look at this. Look at the girth. Look at the bone on that. You know. You, you know, put some fast blood in there, tighten that up a little. And that's just how we did things back then. You know, we tried to get the, you know, everybody was chasing the same dragon, you know. <clears throat> and then next year, you know, to be different dogs coming, you know, dogs you didn't even know that were coming that were like, holy smokes, look at this. <laughs> and it was a good time, you know, we really, and that's how it evolved. It was just a venue to showcase the extreme American Bulldogs. That's all. So you didn't waste your time. Yeah. Well, f far as I, you know, I, like I say, me, I look at a dog 
you could tell a lot by looking, you know, the con overall con conformation. But you got to remember, the, the I don't know anything about this new stuff. You know, the colors. They, these guys, they start talking numbers when, when it comes to colors. You got to have this gene and this gene and um, embark this and embark that. I mean, it. you know, we had none of that. And, you know, so that this, my, you know, for me, my, my stage of the game, I'm not about the learning. You know, I take the dog that looks, you know, healthy. Um, it's got good rear, good fronts, good bites, nice tight eyes. Um, I, you know, I, re I rely on what I know. And um, that all that stuff may be really good, you know. I, I'm, you know, I'm really the wrong guy to uh, <laughs> ask that. Um, well, I don't even know if it works or not. I don't, you know, I really, really don't know. But I mean, uh, I don't think there's anything better with to put hands on a dog. This way here, you get to see their temperament too, which is important. And um, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in watching the dog move and putting my hands on the dog, and, you know, put my eyes on the dog. Other than that, um, I've never done any of that stuff. I'm old school, you know. Maybe that stuff's really, really good. I, I don't know. Same with the Bulldogs. It's pretty much same with the Bulldogs. Hey, you know, son, if you lose tight, I don't care what kind of Bulldog it is. You got to bring a dog in that's going to throw tight. You know, and like I said right from the beginning, in, you know, this is controversial. But this is the way I see it, right? Every generation, the American Bulldog is bred. It seems like, well, I, I, like, it, I can't even say it seems like. Back in the day, we had some block-headed, short-mugged, massive dogs, okay? And we had a lot of them, okay? The dogs of today are not the dogs of yesterday the, with the American Bulldogs. You know, people are, oh, you know, you got people going to say what they want, but they can say what they want. But that's a fact. And here's the thing. And there's a reason behind it. Because the Bulldog was brought into the American Bulldog. See, the history of the American Bulldog, whether people want to believe it or not, they didn't come off the Mayflower with Christopher Columbus or nothing like that. They were a working hog dog. That was what the American Bulldogs were. I had, an, I had a guy... And I'll never forget it. I, it was, it was not, he was out of Alabama and I got his number from another breeder of American Bulldogs. It's kind of a funny story. And it, I didn't understand it back then, but I got, I finally got, it. it took me 40 years to get, understand what he meant. So I'm talking to him and I said, Hey, you got American Bulldogs? He goes, yeah, I got American Bulldogs. I said, you know, can I ask you something? And, you know, he could tell by my accent, you know, I'm from, he thought I was from, you from New York? I says, no, I'm Connecticut. He goes, I said, same thing, no. He says, I said to him, you got both, you got American Bull? He goes, yeah. I says, you would happen to have something with the, uh, you know, a, a big blocky head with a short muzzle, do you? He says, son. He, no, he says, what do you want with that? I said, well, people up here, up on the East Coast, you know, People want that kind of dog. You know, we could sell those dogs for a lot of money, you know. He says, you know, son, someday you're going to have a million dollars. But that doesn't make it an American bulldog. <laughs> I never, and I never understood, you know, I thought about what he said. So he was telling me, yeah, you'll, you know, you might sell those dogs, but that doesn't make it an American Bulldog. And it took years for me, and I never forgot what he said to me, you know. So what I'm saying is that was the original American Bulldog. John D. did his thing. He made these dogs super bulldoggy. But when you breed them out, you're you're going to lose the bulldogginess. And like I say, there's dogs out there today. That, yeah, they're, they're beautiful. There's You're limited. It's limited, though. Very limited. You know, we had, you know, back in the day, we think the stuff that came off that bulldozer bull blood was just crazy. It was bananas. You know, the, the mountain gator kennel dogs were through your consistent litters of bam, bam and doozy and half acre. And the dogs that were, they were spitting off these dogs were, it was insane. 
there was a dog out there called Bull. You would, uh, there was just, you know, we had, I had a Mufasa son, Cade, and uh, there was T-Rex, and there was, uh, Sean Chris had a dog called Kong. I mean, man, we could, I could be here all day talking about just freaks. You know, so people could say what they want about the American Bulldog today. You know, like I said, I would keep saying it because I got some friends that are into the American Bulldogs and they got some fire. But you're limited. You're very limited on who has it. Back to, you know, so it's very special to them because they're very fortunate to still have it because they did the right things with the blood. It's a handful of guys that I see out there that have it, you know. But um, back in the day, there was more diversity because there was a bunch of different lines producing that. You know, today, you know, you might breed a bully dog to a pretty bully dog and not even get a bully dog out of it. I see that all the time. You know, it's a little different now, you know. We had more extreme dogs. And our extreme dogs were 100, over 100 pounds, 110 pounds all day. You know, today, some of the, you know, or slightly smaller, like you know, it's just it's just different, you know. I'm not I'm not bashing the dogs of today. I I I love the dogs of today too. I love, but back in the day, we had more blood, different bloodlines to cross together because we stayed with the bully to the bully. But now it's kind of hard to do that with the American bulldogs today. Like I say, there's a handful. Your gene pool is a lot smaller now, but there's some guys out there with got some fire still. And you just got to know where to go to get them, you know? Well, you know, like I say, you know, as a breeder, and it were kind of reversed back to what I say. I do it, you know, for me, I do whatever it's going to take to get it done. Whatever it takes. There's no rules and no limits for me. I do what I want, you know. I, it only matters what I have at the end of the leash. It's all that matters. And whatever you think is going to get you there you just do it right but you know that's me that's who i am you know i want to get there i want to get there now and um you know what i would say to the you know breeders is um know what you want do what it takes to get there and um you know, sometimes you don't expect people to um, ever pat you on the back and say, hey, bro, you know something? Nice dog. You may not get that, but that's okay. Know what you have. Breed for what you want. It's going to make you happy. If you want a dog that's like me, like a 20-inch dog with 26-inch head, one-inch muzzle, heavy bone, short back muscled up does it really matter how how you get it no matter to me how i get it you gotta have it you know what i mean that that's just you know but you know no matter how you get there you just gotta get there and the sooner the better you know <laughs> you know that's just uh makes me a little sound a little nutty but that's what i've always done Whatever it takes, right? whatever it takes to get there, you know. And uh, sometimes you got to make them yourself. I'm not above that. I do whatever. So I just, you know, I call them. That's why I just call everything bulldogs now. You know, said so I'm not going to get crazy, start putting letters in front of the door. F1, F2, F3, oldie, English, American, blah, blah, blah. The bulldog. That's it. Nothing fancy, you know. But, it, but it's got to look the part, you know. Yeah. I looked apart. Right. Well, you know, you know what it is. Like I said before, as a breeder, or even as you know, a pet owner, you know, the most important thing is to know what you want. Okay. You know, I, you know, if you want a pure performance bulldog, man, there's some good ones out there. Okay, and the hats off to them. There's a there's a place for those dogs in this world. Trust me when I tell you. Most respect for the guys that are working them dogs. Um, uh, knowing what knowing what style dog you want is very important. 
You know what I mean? And getting there is also, uh, it's, it's your job to, to get there, you know, whatever it takes to get there, whatever you, you know, as a breeder, you look at traits on certain dogs that you like and you, and you go for it, you know, you know, and like I say, you know, the dog back in the peewee dogs to refer back when I was 11, you know, it was 80, 85 pound dogs, 19 inch tall dog. And you know, you know something? I'm 63 now, and that's still the damn dog that I like. You know, I'd like them slightly bigger. You know, I tweaked it a little bit, you know, maybe pushing the 100 pound mark, you know, maybe a little bigger head. You're always going to want that kind of stuff, and whatever it takes to get there. But it, I'm, and I'm happy. I look out in my yard and I look at, I line the dogs up in the kennel. And they all got these big old apple cheek heads, short mugs, tight eyes, tight bites. They got a little fire to them, massive bone, a lot of girth, big rear. I'm good. I'm right where I need to be. Don't care who's got this. Don't care who's got that. I'm where I need to. I'm in my lane. I'm in my lane. This is what I like. And that's important because nobody's going to say to me, hey, man, you got a nice dog. That's not going to happen. You got to know what you have. You got to know um, what your dog will bring to the table. If someone decided they wanted to use one or something, you know, what am I bringing to the table? You know what I mean? And um, that's important. You know, these people, they get into this thinking they're going to get glory. First of all, the days of making money with dogs are over. They happen. There's a limited few people that can actually do it. And the time that they put in it to make that money, it still ain't worth it. It has to be your passion. You know, you want to create, we don't know how much it takes to create the kind of dog that I like, <laughs> the time and the money that goes into it. Dogs that, you know, don't make the cut, that you lose, you know, you do a breeding, you keep some pups back, they don't turn out quite what you what you, what you thought they should have and over the years and years and years and decades of you know raising a dog for a year and all the vets and there's no especially now but there's no money in dogs if you think you're gonna make money in dogs talk to some guys that got dogs like i say very few people are making money now if you want to do it because i like the kind of dog i like i have to make it's that simple I can't go to no one's yard and say, this is what I want. You know, I want a hundred pound dog, 27 inch head. I want cheeks like softballs. You know, I want, first of all, if they had it, you're not getting it. Number one, if they had it, you gotta make, you gotta make them. Or sometimes I hooked up with a guy over here in Connecticut, right? He has passion for dogs. He did a breeding. I said to the kid, it was a younger guy. I mean, I say, hey, man, that breeding might work. That breeding might click. That's something I would have done. I bought his whole litter. Bought the whole litter. Then we collaborated between me and him. Nice kid, um, Curtis. Um, we did a collaboration. I had a, a, a male. I said, hey, man, I got this male. It'll click. We bred to his female, and the, and the dog's or gorgeous. Um, that, that, that that's you know that's what I mean. You know, uh, that's just how it's. Uh, you know, you got to make them. Sometimes you got to make them yourself. You got to work with someone else that has the same vision as you. Um, but I can't go out and buy that dog. I you know like I say nobody's maybe. Like some people might not know how to get to that point with the dog, you know, some, and, and like I say, it has to click too. That's the thing. Sometimes you think you're going to get something and you do the breeding and it don't work. Well, what did that cost you? So uh, as far as making money with dogs, forget about it. If you're in it to make money, man, you better go do something else. Cause it's a lot of, it's a lot of work and uh, you're not going to get paid, <laughs> you know? And if you want to spend, um, a specialty dog, a dog that you really want, have in your head, this is what I want. 
I'm not happy until I have that 20 inch tall dog, that 100 pound dog, that 27 inch head dog with big giant apple cheeks that couldn't breathe, couldn't function. If that's what you want, you might have to make it, bro. <laughs> You're gonna have to make it, and, and that's that's just the way that's the way the game is. Well, that, you know, Sean, that's that's out of my jurisdiction. <laughs> you know, Sean. Um, I have a, a very, very good friend. You probably know her, Jamie Sweet, right? She's the best, right? And uh, she always, you know, was trying to talk me into do a song with these little shorties she got. As much as I love her, man, uh, I said, Jamie, I just, you know, I can't, I don't have the passion for those dogs. <laughs> and, you know, and, you know, so the more I've been around them, you know, I'm sorry, they were starting, they got to say, they grew, they grew on me, but um, I wouldn't have the, you know, I never did anything like that. Um, uh, I wouldn't, I couldn't tell you, you know, I couldn't tell you. I really couldn't. That's, you know, she could tell you. I'll tell you that. If anybody could tell you, she's the one, man. She's the one that we all go to, man. When we have, we got in, we're, you know, we're trying to figure things out, man. That Jamie Sweet number, we're, I'm on her, man. I'm on it. Yeah. And uh, she, always has, she always has the right answers. Yeah, she knows her genetics, doesn't she? Yes, she does, man. Yeah. There's a one, you know, you talk about a, I call her a dog guy, but you talk about a dog person, boy. Yeah. You know, she's, she's a sweetheart, too. Yeah. So if it wasn't, if you had all the time, money, and help in the world, what what's the second breed that you would run with on your yard? Um, I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm a bulldog guy through and throughout you know um i like my american bulldogs i like my oldies they're a different breed they have different there's things about each one of them i like um I'm trying to think uh yeah i just those are the two those I, there's really no other dogs that uh, do it for me no what about no. The, what about the american bully um, there's, there's been a few that I've seen that I, I kind of, you know, that I was feeling, um, I just can't, I, I really am a big fan of those apple cheeks on a dog. I, I just, there's just something about when that head fills in and you have a big, broad muzzle and the stop goes distinctly like go straight up and then you come to those cheeks and uh i actually seen some american bullies like that very few but i have seen a couple and um they usually have the longer muzzle um um american bully would probably be my third you know but i there again i'd have to make my own you know i'd have to make that head a little, you know just just broaden that head up a little bit and uh you know be an, an extreme style in america bully maybe not quite an xl but well years ago they used to have an extreme class um i think they did away with it now i don't know that's you know it's just another registry thing but um yeah that's what i'd probably move what i would do i would take an american bully and uh i'd put a big apple cheek oldie on it <laughs> get my ears done and let me tell you that fire it would be hot it would be a hot looking dog you know but that's what I, that would be my third probably a bully america bully big one no not pocket no it'd have to be either standard size extreme you know something like that 